What's scarier? Strange, unexplainable noises and spirits that go bump in the night? Or a real-life boogeyman who's still at large after a terrifying killing spree? Fear has a way of grabbing you, changing you, and staying with you, no matter whether it comes from the supernatural or from living next door to a serial killer. Let's look into the notion of fear and how it has stayed with a community for generations, today on Homespun Hates. Hello, welcome to Homespun Hates. I'm Becky. And I'm Diana. And today on the show, we're very excited to bring on Rebecca Everett and Jessica Remo of the podcast, Father Wants Us Dead. <laughs> this is a very exciting moment for us because we usually do not interview exclusively true crime podcasters. That's true. But this is scary on a different kind of level. Ooh, it's so creepy. You'll notice that the format of today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Instead of sharing ghost stories with us, Rebecca and Jessica are going to be talking about the nature of fear and how it can affect a community. Unlike a lot of the experiences that we talk about here, which are very personal and only one or two people experience it, this is the sort of thing that an entire community experiences and then just becomes part of the folklore of the area. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be a really, really cool conversation. And if you don't know who John List is, you're going to really, really enjoy this episode, learning all about him and the things that he did. If you do know who John List is, you're going to really love listening to this because there's going to be some juicy details that you may not have known about. Before we bring on our guests, Diana, I really do need to tell you about the evening I had last night. I know that you were Uh texting me and I was like, I can't talk. I can't look at my calendar. Even though I shouldn't have been, I started texting you things like, help me and send wine and stuff like that. (laughs) This is when you're at the middle school recital. Yes, my daughter had her middle school choir recital performance last night. It was very cute, but it brought back some really, really interesting memories. Having gone through a music program in college, even though my degree isn't in it, having gone to music camps, subletting from a soprano, all of the things, I have interacted with a lot of vocalists. And yes, there will always be a soft spot in my heart for a cappella groups. I think it's amazing what people can do with their voices. It is a little bit of a guilty pleasure. I watched all the Pitch Perfect movies and loved them. <laughs> However, there is just something about when you have your instrument with you all the time and you never have to put it down. I remember walking to class and an entire group of 30 kids walking toward me singing their beautiful voices all at once. And let me tell you, the first couple of times this happens, it's pretty cool. But on the sixth or seventh time, it's like, I do not need to hear Enter the Sandman in six-part harmony on my way to class or on my way to my fiddle lesson. This is what it's like if you go to school with a music program, if you go to music camp, or if you are around singers a lot, it is constant. It is constant. You cannot go eat anything or go anywhere or do anything without running into a group of about 30 people singing at the top of their lungs. And like I said, it's kind of cool at first, not so cool if you're trying to take a nap and they're outside your window. If I walked up to some one of these people maybe singing in solo and it was somebody that I needed to have a conversation with, you walk up and they're in the middle of a song and you're like, hey, can I borrow a copy of your homework assignment? And they just keep singing. They just look you straight in the eye. They acknowledge you, but they keep singing and they have a look on their face like the song is so much more important than whatever you have to ask me about. It's not like I can whip out my fiddle and respond (laughs) because I don't have my fiddle on me. It's a cold November day. My fiddle is curled up under the bed next to the radiator going, I ain't going out there. Uh Uh-uh. 
It's not like I can retort with my fiddle. I just got to stand there. And I, you know, and I, I'm not a very good singer. I'm not going to like try and respond in alto. I got to just kind of wait for the song to end. And sometimes they've already drifted off before they hit that final <laughs> note. Or they decide there needs to be a repeat. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm not doing my homework. So... <laughs> so just to recap, Becky hates the fact that occasionally she lives in a real live musical where people burst into professional six part harmony on the street and she gets to enjoy it for free during her day to day life. She wishes she had a fiddle to put them in their place. <laughs> That's the summary I'm hearing. Is that right, well, Becky? Well, I do hate musicals, so yeah. Hey. Yeah, I went to a state school, so all I saw between classes was people walking with their heads down drinking caffeine. Oh, okay. Nah, caffeine isn't good on the vocal cords. So anyway, all of these memories came flooding back of my youth living in a real-time musical. <laughs> As I'm watching this choral performance, which was very cute. The kids were really good. They had beautiful voices, but it was... A little bit of suffering on my end because <laughs> it was a student <laughs> performance. And the final straw was the last song. You know, the Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Bells? No, not that okay. one. Okay, let me just read a little bit to you because the copyright has long run out for this. So it's perfectly fine for me to read it. <laughs> Homespun hates production of The Bells. <laughs> Hear the sledges with the bells, silver bells, what a world of merriment their melody foretells, how they tinkle, tinkle, tinkle in the icy air of night, while the stars that oversprinkle all the heavens seem to twinkle with a crystalline delight, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the tintinabulation that so musically wells from the bells, 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 from the jingling and the tinkling of the bells. Okay, that's verse one. I see why that's not as popular as some of his other poems. The second verse is about marriage. Mellow Wedding Bells. Oh, I thought you were going to say they changed bells to hell in the second verse. It talked about hell, 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 No, this this is is why it's classic Poe, right? So the first one is like, oh, sleds in the snow. The second verse is about wedding bells. The third verse is about the bells on an ambulance and a fire truck. Because again, this is the 1800s, so there would have been actual bells on there. What a tale their terror tells of despair. How they clang and clash and roar. What a horror they outpour on the bosom of the palpitating air. Ooh, Ooh this is getting spicy now. All right. And then the fourth verse is about funeral bells. It gets really good. And the people, ah, the people, they that dwell up in the steeple all alone. And who tolling, tolling, tolling in that muffled monotone. Fill a glory in so rolling on the human heart a stone. They are neither man nor woman. They are neither brute nor human. They are ghouls. And their king it is who tolls. And he rolls, rolls, rolls. A peon from the bells. And his merry bosom swells with the peon of the bells. And he dances and he yells, keeping time, time, time in a sort of runic rhyme to the peon of the bells of the bells. And it goes on and on and on. So that's how it ends. Oh, uh, okay. It, it kind of redeems itself. Exactly, I like that part. Exactly, right? So... That's what that poem is about. And I loved this poem as a kid. You know me. I was a sick, twisted little Wednesday-like child. Mm -hmm. Anytime in English classes in high school, they'd be like, Becky, would you like to read a poem? And I'd be like, I sure would. I'm going to read The Bells by Edgar Allan Poe. So imagine my horror when the choir, the entire full middle school choir broke out in song. Somebody had converted that first verse into a Christmas song. Wow. Just the first verse, though. I had to leave. Oh, no. I couldn't handle it. (laughs) Like, stood up and walked right out in the middle of the song. (laughs) I hope your daughter didn't notice. I wasn't feeling too good. I am sick. I was sitting there trying to endure it while, like, snot's rolling out of my face and stuff. I'm like, I'm just going to sit here. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to tough it out. I'm going to tough it out. And then they started singing that, and I was like, I can't do it. (laughs) And I just got up and left. (laughs) Went to the bathroom, blew my nose. By the time I came back, it was mercifully over. So... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> my terrible mother maybe they sang all four verses no no i don't think so anyway that was my evening i was able to come back and i cracked open a new horror novel and that sort of cleansed my soul after that encounter <laughs> <laughs> i have many good memories of middle school choir see oh so you were an annoying choir kid <laughs> yes i'm still annoying <laughs> all right i am still friends with diana so maybe i can redeem myself a little bit there <laughs> Everybody vote if you want to see a video of Diana singing in public and Becky recording with a violin curtly, (laughs) timely, and inappropriately. 
but not when the weather's cold. My violin doesn't like the cold. Neither does my voice. It's okay. We can do this fiddle bottle sometime when it's warm. Warm, humidity controlled room with good acoustics. Yes, that sounds fabulous. Awesome. All right. Well, before I dig myself into a deeper live musical hole, <laughs> for those of you that are new to the show, we do have an Instagram. You can follow us at Homespun Haints, and you can also follow us on TikTok at Homespun Haints. Instagram is where we post a lot of fun facts about the episodes, including images that can accompany this episode. And TikTok is a great place if you're looking for ghostly advice on what to do about the unseen entities that might be crawling around your basement. And if you want to have all of that combined, please visit our show notes at homespunhaints.com. We also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash homespunhaints, where our patrons get bonus content. And if you're not a member of our Patreon, enjoy this commercial. The mass murder of an innocent family forever shook this quiet town. Your children? How do you, like, oh my God, how do you do that? It's the story of the ultimate escape. After he killed them all and left, I was always so scared he was going to come back and get me. Isn't that crazy? The man they were chasing after, the father, John Liss. Subscribe to Father Wants Us Dead on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Today on the show, we have another set of podcasters, very excited to introduce Rebecca Everett and Jessica Remo of the podcast Father Wants Us Dead. It is a highly acclaimed podcast, and both Rebecca and Jessica are award-winning journalists with quite a career behind them. So we're very thrilled to have them on the show today, and they are going to talk to us a little bit about John List and his legacy of fear. Rebecca and Jessica, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and about Father Wants Us Dead. We don't really do a lot of true crime guests on this podcast. So tell us also a little bit about the process that you go behind and what investigative journalism really looks like in a podcast setting and things of that nature. So let's start with you, Rebecca. Thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to be here. Yeah, so I'm a reporter. I've been a reporter for 13 years, I'm originally from Massachusetts, and worked there for six years. And then I was in New Jersey after that. And so I didn't hear about John List's story at all until I came to New Jersey. It just was the perfect podcast topic. And Jess is the perfect podcast co-host for that topic <laughs> because she grew up in Union County and really knows it so well and could really teach me about the legacy of, like you said, that fear in the area and really what its impact on a whole generation of people. And Jessica? She's totally oversold me, but <laughs> also a journalist before being a podcast host, was a journalist for about 15 years prior to Father Wants Us Dead and covered all manner of local news and crime and investigations and then became a columnist. But I did spend a ton of my reporting time covering Union County, where I grew up. And John List is well known among a certain generation of folks in Union County who were around when the murders happened. Westfield itself, pretty interesting town. I would say it's one of the top two towns in Union County, the place where you want to live if you don't in Union County. So it was always sort of the awful thing that happened in this beautiful, quiet suburb where everybody wants to live. And for people who don't know anything about John List, tell us where Union County is and give us a little bit of a history of the murders and the story behind it. So people who have no knowledge whatsoever can sort of jump in and know what you're talking about. Union County is an area in northern central New Jersey. There's debate about whether central Jersey exists, but it's in that area. <laughs> uh, bedroom community, easy access to Manhattan, beautiful old Victorian homes. When John List was alive and now, I've said it on the podcast, if you have a house in Westfield, you've pretty much made it. Oh, okay. okay. And John List grew up actually not in New Jersey, in Michigan. He grew up in this Lutheran family. They were very old fashioned and very strict. And his father was kind of aloof and his mother was kind of doting on him. And he just really didn't socialize comfortably, didn't have a lot of friends. As he grew up, he was just this very proper, kind of obsessed with being proper, being pious all his life, married a woman who was very much the opposite. 
They started to raise a family. They had troubles. He couldn't keep a job. His wife had illness and she drank too much as far as he was concerned. They moved to New York and then they moved to Westfield, New Jersey in 1965. They just fell in love with this mansion, which they could not afford. They just wanted that that picture of success. They wanted to be the model family and it wasn't to be. And instead of admitting to his wife that he lost his job or even collecting unemployment, he just sat at the train station every day pretending to go to work while they went into debt. He was basically living off his mother's accounts until that ran out of money. And in his sort of obsessive way, he just spiraled thinking about it and decided that the best thing to do for his family would be to kill them all while they were all still good Christians so they would go to heaven. And instead of seeing that as a sin, he saw it would be a sin if he let them live in poverty, that that would take them away from God. So he did. He carefully executed this plan, made a good cover story, told everyone they were going to visit family because someone was sick in North Carolina, and shot them one by one in his house. His wife, then his mother, then he had a sandwich. He made lunch, sat in the house, and waited for his kids to come home from school or their after-school jobs and shot them one at a time as they walked into the house and then left their bodies on sleeping bags in the ballroom of this mansion, spent the night there, and then took off in the morning. It wasn't until a month later that the bodies were discovered, and by then he was long gone. Wow. That was an excellent summary. By it's very, kind of long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's a long perfect. story. That's, that's half and the that's story. And that's just the beginning. Yeah, that is <laughs> yes. just the beginning. It was a story that we thought we knew, but there were just so many new details that were just really surprising to us. And I think it had been a lot of years since this had been really analyzed. And with the amount of time that's gone by, it was like great to look back at all that stuff. So I imagine that you've uncovered some new stones that had not been known about before you started digging into his past. Yeah. Some of the things were police records that we hadn't seen before. Getting FBI records is really, really hard because they'll tell you, oh, like check back in a year (laughs) and you might get something. What those records showed us about how extensive the search was. They were talking to police in Germany. They were looking in Canada. They were really looking everywhere for him once he disappeared. And it is kind of shocking how well he was able to just disappear because he looked so normal. He just looked like your everyday guy. So nobody noticed when this new guy moved to Denver, Colorado and started living under a new name. Around about what year was this? The murders were in 1971. So that's when he disappeared and started his new life. And he lived under the name Robert Clark until he got caught in 1989. Almost 20 years. (laughs) Yeah. So what was he doing as Robert Clark? Did he get a new family and kill them too? I mean, what what was his second life? (laughs) That's half true. Although we don't know what would have happened had time gone on. But he eventually sort of resumed a life that looked similar to the life he led. He became an accountant again and eventually starts dating, meets a woman, remarries. She has absolutely no idea who he is, anything about his past, truly duped her. And yeah, and just sort of went about his life. They eventually moved to Richmond, Virginia, and that is part of where he eventually got captured. We can get into that if you'd like, but just straight up started over. Like none of this ever happened. And in his memoir, said he put it out of his mind as best he could. I imagine he wrote a memoir in prison. Correct. Yeah, he had an old army buddy who was a journalist and author who started visiting him in prison and sort of corresponding. So they wrote the memoir that way. It's really interesting because it's very John List. It's very cold and detached, which is sort of his personality. We talk about it in the podcast, but he's not a psychopath based on what the experts have seen, but he did lack some empathy. And part of that was a personality disorder he had that wasn't, you know, it's not psychopathic. It's just different. I'm just curious. Does it irk you when somebody gets away with a heinous crime, goes to prison, and then is able to profit off of their crime yeah. through totally. a book. sale of books. <laughs> Rebecca, yeah. I think, equated this memoir to O.J. Simpson's If I Did It. Oh. It's it's their retelling of their own story the way they'd like to tell it. And in the podcast, we're pretty careful about that. Every time we're mentioning clips from the memoir, we take this with a grain of salt. Right. right. In New Jersey, we have what's called, they call him the son of Sam law, that says that he couldn't profit from it. 
So actually, I am not sure if the prison buddy is the one who made any money from it. I ordered it online and it was, what's one of those books that they just print it when you order it? But his prison buddy has since died too. So I don't know where that money goes, but supposedly he wasn't supposed to be able to access it. As we try to think about what our next season should be about, what next crime or story we should feature, I can see how John List was just the perfect podcast topic because his story lasts his entire life. It's not a one bad deed and then it's over, but it also has these really interesting characters in it and really sympathetic characters. And it happened a long time ago, but there's still a lot of people who are alive who remember it really, really well. That's like the hardest part for us is when you're doing a story about something awful that happened, you have to try and get people to talk and sometimes they don't want to. In this case, the crime was so old and people all had their sort of connection to it or their little, oh yeah, it was part of that. So they were like really game to talk to us, which was super lucky. The number of emails we get from people who just want to say, oh, I grew up in the town next door and we used to go over there every Halloween just to like see where the house used to be or really ridiculous stuff like bad jokes that people would make amongst each other about John List because it just became this shared reference. It's not a good joke to make, but it is a shared reference that everyone can think about and gasp. And that's what we're going to get into today is the legacy that he has left on this community and how it is, like you said, a commonality that people have. But also, I'm sure there's like an underlying undercurrent of fear, I guess, in the area still like, oh, this sort of thing could happen. It did happen here in this sleepy, little, beautiful, mansion-ridden community. Could you talk a little bit to that and how the nature of fear has sort of coalesced in this area? When we talk to people, a lot of what we would hear is sort of this sense that back when it happened, it was almost like the Manson killings because it was a time when people just felt like something like this couldn't happen near them. And whether it's just that our media is more ever-present now, and so we hear about murder-suicides more, we hear about school shootings, things like that, that are really shocking, but almost seem very frequent. And I think back in 1971, it didn't feel like that for people, because that really felt like, like, people would tell us it was like JFK getting shot, the Challenger crashing, and John List murdering his family. It was such a big event for them. And I think that's why it really stuck in their memories. But then you also you have the fact that when John List got caught on America's Most Wanted in 1989, it made it really real for this whole new generation. And he was back in the headlines, and then there was a big trial. Regular people in town just went to the trial because they wanted to catch a glimpse of this boogeyman from their youth. It was really something that people couldn't let go of. And obviously, we can't do that either. <laughs> I think when we were trying to decide whether this was a podcast or not, and did it really have the elements, we decided what made it scariest was that John List could be your neighbor. He looked so average. He seemed so proper, so pious. From the outside, I think as Rebecca and I dug deeper, we found the cracks in that surface. But if you didn't know the guy, he'd be the last person you'd expect to do something like this. And then just familial aside in general, how does someone kill their family, their kids? We still can't wrap our heads around this. And then go on to live a normal life. Yeah. Afterwards, normally you hear murder-suicides happening. Right. I think a lot of investigators thought when they couldn't find him that he probably came to terms with what he did and did kill himself. But, but he didn't. And he said he maybe would think about them on the anniversary of the killings. But other than that, it wasn't really in his mind very much. While he was in prison, he does this interview with Connie Chung, and she asks him specifically about the sandwich moment, which is one of the most horrifying details of the whole thing, that he could sit and make and eat a sandwich after he had just murdered his mother and wife and knowing what he was about to do next. And she says, you know, how could you do that? And he just says, I was hungry. Do you feel like the community there, I mean, I know there's sort of this morbid fascination that they all have with John List. If it's still like, oh, this is the church where John List attended and this is the house. You mentioned that there's this fear that happened at the time because he looked like anybody and it kind of made people come to terms with the idea that, oh my gosh, this could happen to me. This could happen to somebody I know because this guy looks so normal. 
Is there this ongoing fear that there might be a copycat crime that happens in the area or that there might be a repeat of the events that happened 40, 50 years ago? I hope there's not a copycat. I think the fear subsided when he was caught. It was scarier when he was out there. Maybe he's going to come back. Maybe he's hiding under my bed. Maybe he's in my attic. We heard this time and time again. I would hope that the communities recovered from this and the thought that someone else might do this in Westfield. But as we see now with The Watcher, which again, another true crime case, this really did happen. We really did report on it at the Ledger when this family started getting creepy notes. Every time something spooky happens in Westfield now, John List comes up again. So it's come to the surface again when that occurred, and now yet again because it's a Netflix hit series. I think the fear has sort of evolved over the years too, because when it first happened, the bodies are discovered. Everyone's hearing about it, including kids at school who saw this empty desk in their class for a month and now suddenly finds out that that kid's dad killed him. That is a very real fear. They didn't understand why he did it. Their parents couldn't explain it. No one could. He left a confession letter and explained things, but the police didn't release it. So people didn't really know why he had done this. And it just made it that much scarier. They didn't know if he was going to come back or if he had ever left or if he was hiding in the woods. There were so many rumors about where he might be and why he had done it. And especially kids who knew the family were afraid he was going to come back and get them. And... There were all these rumors about this reservation in Union County, Wachung Reservation, and people were convinced that witches and satanic groups were doing animal sacrifice in the woods. We heard this from so many people. Like, we can't put it in the podcast. I don't think there were Satanists involved in the list murders, you know, but it kind of just felt like it went together for everyone. This culture of fear, everything sort of came back to John List. And then As the years went on, it became something to speculate about, like we said, like a common reference and almost like a real-life urban legend where the story gets bigger in the retelling. Between John List and now The the Watcher, awareness being made of that, have people tried to lump a supernatural explanation into it for why this is occurring? And it sounds like you said, yes, there's these rumors that there's Satanists and evil witchcraft happening nearby, also lumped in with a Native American reservation. There's just so many things wrong with that, poured into one thing. But is that how people are trying to come to grips with it in some ways, that these things could happen in this area? It must be something, there must be something paranormal involved that's causing it. Do you see a lot of that more than just like one or two stories? It's sort of like whether or not you believe in the paranormal, I think, is the first question. Uh You know, if you do, I think you, yeah, I think you can make an argument that like Westfield's sort of haunted, right? There's these two spooky things that had happened. And then Charles Adams, who wrote The Adams Family, is from Uh Westfield. So they have like, I've mentioned that they have like a trifecta of spooky, right? Between List and The Watcher and Charles Adams. But I never took it deeper than that, you know? Is there more to it? Yeah, I mean, there are definitely deaths that happened around that time and in that county of especially young women and one especially that some people have thought was tied to witches or satanism or something like that and I think a lot of that was the time like I almost wonder if we went to every county in New Jersey if someone would say oh yeah there were witches in this woods over here in the 70s or the 80s everyone was more afraid of those things like we talk about that in the podcast well and this is that other element of the paranormal is that it it only came out at John List's trial that his daughter Patty was calling herself a witch, telling her friends that, and sort of dabbling in those things. And some of it was just using a Ouija board, which nowadays we don't think very much of it. But back in the early 70s, that might have been kind of wild and certainly might make your father upset if he's the pious John List. I think Rebecca and I both talked about that. Like, doesn't every teenage girl have, like, sort of a witchy phase where you, like, have a Ouija board? You wrote an article on that. Yeah, it's it's called the Robinson age. Oh, there's a term. Wow. We've come to the right place. Yeah, there's a term for that. (laughs) When you become a spooky young teen. (laughs) It's completely developmentally appropriate to start playing with Ouija boards in, like, your tween and early teen years. Mm -hmm. It's normal, especially if you're a girl. And if you live in Westfield, like maybe that's when you're sneaking into the woods and telling ghost stories and creeping yourself out with John Lisk. It all sort of makes sense together. So his daughter that he murdered was professing that she was practicing witchcraft at the time. 
Did John List himself cite that in his memoir at all as a factor, or did he kind of gloss over that? He basically says in his memoir that it was mostly about this financial ruin of the family. That made him feel like he needed to find a way out. And then the religion and well-being of his family sort of gave him the rationale of, well, I can't just leave them behind or they won't be Christians anymore because they'll be broke and won't have my leadership. And so instead he decided to control them and kill them all and convince himself that was what was right. So in his memoir, he lists three things that I didn't want to make too much of it because it's not like this is why he killed his family, but they were just these little moments that set him off a little bit. And one was his daughter, Patty, getting caught sneaking out of the house at night. And then one was her using a Ouija board with her friends. And then the third thing was so silly. It was that he walked into the kitchen and someone had put like a little garter snake on the counter and all the kids were in the room sort of giggling and he thought that they were playing a prank and he just like quietly took the snake out of the house. And that's it. And you're like, it's almost <laughs> This is ridiculous. the last straw. I'm going to kill yeah, everybody. It's just so silly. Like who would even, it's just such a nothing moment. And that you think that this is a man in jail in prison decades later. And he's like, yeah, these kids put this snake on the counter and I'm still remembering it all these years later like a big deal because he expected his kids to be perfect angels and never do anything like that. So the Ouija board does get a mention there, but it gets it alongside very minor things that aren't really that important in the grand scheme of things. You kind of mentioned this as like, this area is like this trifecta of hauntedness between the Watcher and the Adams Family origins. The house that inspired the Adams Family is there. And then also John List. You think that a story such as this of what the community went through, of knowing that their neighbor who looked like a normal guy had managed to kill his entire family in cold blood and was still out there. Is that more scary or less scary than, say, a rumor that your house was built on a cemetery where the tombstones were moved, but the bodies weren't, or other classic supernatural horror tropes? What's scarier to you? She's asking you to pit true crime and paranormal <laughs> against each other right I hear now. It. Don't fall I hear for it. it. It's a trick. <laughs> All right. So I'll play full journalist and say that I, I'm the skeptic and am much more horrified by the things I've written about over the years, the stories we've covered, the trials we've been to. I think truth is stranger than fiction for the most part. The real Watcher story is scarier than in the Netflix retelling. As to paranormal, yeah, I don't know. The jury's still out on that. I did a whole column on ghost hunting once, and it was fun. But the crimes, the true, real murder, how someone does that, I just feel closer to that as a journalist and having covered it, and, and that scares me more. It's, it's what I've seen versus what I can't. See, you're braver than me. My thing is, is I don't even really like to think about the paranormal stuff. Because I don't want to know at all if it's real. Like, I don't want to have like the day where I'm in my house alone and things start floating or <laughs> I see something out of my corner of my eye. Like I just literally do not let myself think about it because <laughs> I'm kind of a chicken. I was honestly afraid that the Watcher show would be too scary because I watched the trailer Aww. and I was like, this might give me nightmares. But it was fine, actually. But the real life stuff, I feel like I know that a little bit better. So it's not scary to you. And the paranormal is, I get it. Yeah, I'm not saying I believe in ghosts, but you can't call the cops on the ghost. <laughs> like I have a, you know, I have a ring doorbell. That's not going to help. <laughs> There's like nothing you can do. And so I almost think like I'd be more likely to live in a house that was like, oh, someone got murdered here than to live in a house where people were like, There's unexplained things happening in this house. I'd be like, nope, <laughs> nope, not even close. So just from a more human interest, emotional standpoint, do you know who discovered the bodies and the circumstances around that discovery? So Patty List, the 16-year-old daughter, her drama teacher was sort of more concerned than, than most that they had been gone for so long. And he kind of got the police a little concerned about it, but then he pulled into the driveway at 10 p.m. with another drama teacher and was like, I'm going to go in the house. I think something's wrong. So the neighbors called the cops, the cops came, and together they all sort of told the cops, we think that maybe the mother, Alma, 84 years old, she could be in the house, so we have to go check. And so they went in the house and discovered the bodies. There is another theory that that drama teacher has since passed away, but he told an author of a true crime book, Death Sentence, that he had actually snuck into the house himself and had already discovered the bodies. 
and that's kind of why he led the police back there. But at trial, that theory was, the judge wasn't having it, basically. It certainly would have muddied the case if some random civilian had been on the crime scene, even though it was pretty obvious there was a confession letter. It wasn't really a who done it by the time they had discovered the bodies. Yeah. And adding to the spookiness is the lights were burning out in the house slowly. So he had the lights on. He had turned down the thermostat, so it was very cold. And there was, we describe it as church music playing on the intercom system in the house. So you were walking into, yeah, just about the spookiest crime scene I can think of. Yeah, I can't imagine, like, the ballroom had a curtain across the door, and they just pulled it back and and shone their flashlights in there, and here are the bodies of the three kids and the mother laid on sleeping bags, like, yeah, like nothing else. The kids still in their winter coats and hats. Why do you speculate, or have others speculated, why he staged the bodies so specifically, and yet in a half-assed way? It's odd. He did do a little sort of ceremony where he read a prayer. He recited a prayer. It does feel ceremonial. It feels sort of tender, but sort of not. Why the sleeping bags? They're dead. I mean, what is the, what is the purpose of that? Although he was very concerned with finances in the house, so I could see it as sort of like laying a tarp so there's not blood stains on the nice floor of the ballroom. In case Maybe he wanted that. to come back and live there later? Yeah. That's part of the reason he turned down the thermostat and all that was so that the pipes didn't burst and cost the bank any money. Yeah, he knew the house was going to go into foreclosure and he basically just wanted to preserve things, right? He didn't want the oil to run out too fast if the heat was on, but he didn't want to turn it down too low because he didn't want the pipes to freeze because if the pipes froze, the house would be damaged. And he told us psychiatrist, well, it's not the bank's fault. Why should I ruin their house? But the bodies laid on the sleeping bags for so long that there was definitely marks on the floor and stuff like that from them. Maybe it was a symbolic burial, the sleeping bags? I've never seen a good explanation for it. One of the TV interviews he did when he was in prison, he, he just said, well, we didn't have a rug in there, so that's why I used the sleeping bags. And I'm like, well, that doesn't actually explain anything (laughs) right same with a sandwich yeah right it's not comfort this isn't like a comfort thing but he also said his mother he shot her in her upstairs apartment and he had said in his memoir that he was trying to like drag her to the bed to lay her there but she was too heavy so he just left her there and that is the end of his confession letter it's like p.s mothers on the third floor she was too heavy to move kind of the coldest postscript ever yeah Oh, yeah. yeah. So the confession letter was cold facts. It wasn't excuses and reasoning. Sort of all of that, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it was still cold. It was cold, still cold yes. reasoning. Yeah. The first line was like, I know that this is wrong, but here are all the reasons that I think it's right. And, and you'll have to agree with me. And it was like, if they were going to live in poverty, then they'd no longer be Christians. And if they no longer been Christians, then what's the point? So I should kill them now while they're still Christians. He never mentioned Patty being into witchcraft, but he said that he was worried that her being in the drama club and getting into acting would have also maybe contributed to her not being a good Christian anymore, which is bananas, <laughs> obviously. Oh, oh. <laughs> Interesting that... He references in the confession letter, the drama club, and it was the drama teacher who allegedly got on the scene before anybody else and led the police there. Oh, do you think something was going on between Patty and the drama teacher? I you don't guys know. are sniffing like it that. out because yeah. <laughs> that is a theory that the drama teacher told that same author of Death Sentence that Patty was in love with him. And I am not sure if it was mostly in his head or if there was an element of a teenage girl with a crush or something, but he ended up years later, I think it was in the 90s making a movie called the Patricia, the Patricia List story, List story. Yep. yeah we watched it on YouTube and recorded our reactions it's horrific it's he portrays her as this sex crazed witchy person trying to get him into her witch cult and all this stuff it's so bizarre and he plays himself I mean it's odd yeah yeah so I think there's a lot of problems there and I think that's like one thing is like maybe you're an innocent 16 year old girl and then someone like that is the one who's helping to tell your story. So we can't really know whatever went on between them, if it was just friendly or mentorship or something like that. But this guy made a movie that said, this is what really happened. And I, I haven't heard a lot of people agree with that. And that was supposed to be a nonfiction film. That, uh, that's how it's built. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And this was the 90s, I think it was, when that movie came out. So 
it was available in the local movie rental stores. It wasn't mass distributed, but people were like, oh yeah, I remember renting this with my family in the 90s. And that's that's crazy. It's strange. The one other thing I could mention is that one of the mysteries we ran into, and there were a number of mysteries. No one ever figured out who burned down the List mansion. It was about a year after the family died that they believed it was arson, but they couldn't figure it out. But also no one was really sad to see it go because it was so creepy at that point. But the mystery that we didn't really think was a mystery that we uncovered was that we had always heard that no one had claimed John List remains from the prison when he died. And I was talking to the Department of Corrections trying to figure out, was he buried in the prison cemetery? There was this little prison cemetery. And I got some records that showed they picked up his cremated remains. And I went to look for the gravestone and it wasn't there. And eventually after that, they told us that someone did claim the remains, but they couldn't tell us who. And so that's one thing in our podcast where we're wondering, was it one of his cousins because he had a big family? Or was it his ex-wife, his second wife, who obviously he wronged her greatly, but maybe she wanted him to get a burial. So that was something. So if any of your listeners <laughs> have any theories yes. out there, we'd love to hear it. Interesting. And who burned down the mansion? Yeah. Was well, it uninhabited at the time, I'm guessing? Yeah. Yeah. And empty and no utilities on or anything. So it's And teens would go by and spook each other and God knows what. Of course. So. That's what happens. Yeah. Right, I'm course. sure it was haunted. It was probably haunted. <laughs> Pretty haunted, but no doubt. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if the police considered that theory. <laughs> I have to say, I find this stuff, true crime, so much scarier than the things that we deal with Me too. on a day-to-day. Yeah. Like ghosts, demons, whatever. Call a priest. This, this is terrifying. Mm. This just seems so much harder for me to wrap my mind around. Which is why we don't do true crime. We leave that right. to you. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and we will leave the paranormal to you for certain. <laughs> this has been so wonderful to talk to you both. Thank you so much for coming on here. Is there anything that we forgot to ask you that you want to make sure that you say? Just the name of the podcast, Father Wants Us Dead. Please go listen. And the name is a reference to something that Patty said she told a friend of hers that Father Wants Us Dead, basically. And Rebecca came up with that as our brilliant title because it is just spooky AF. So please go listen, fatherwantsusdead.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And do you have social handles that people can follow you on as well? Mine is Rebecca J. Everett. Is that Twitter? Yeah. And Jessica? And I'm Jessica Remo NJ for New Jersey, which means I can never leave the state (laughs) (laughs) on on Twitter. (laughs) You all have been listening to Rebecca Everett and Jessica Remo of Father Wants Us Dead, an award-winning podcast told by two award-winning journalists. And as you heard, you can check that out at fatherwantsusdead.com or anywhere you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, etc., And while you're listening for Father Wants Us Dead, be sure you check out homespunhates.com, where we will have show notes for this episode, as well as links to all of the socials for our guests today, and additional facts and whatnot that Diana has put together for our wonderful show notes. You can also find us on Instagram and TikTok at Homespun Haints. And if you're interested in supporting this podcast, please check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash Homespun Haints where you can get this and other episodes ad-free as well as bonus content. Jessica and Rebecca, thank you so much. This has been such a delight to talk to you all. You know your subject inside and out. I did not doubt that from the get-go, but it has been wonderful to talk to you, and you have some very, very insightful answers to our questions, even with regards to the paranormal. So I thank you very much thank for you. sharing your knowledge with us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys so much. This was fun. And listeners, if you find yourself in Westfield, New Jersey, make sure you avoid teen witches, calculated murderers, and creepy drama teachers, or you'll probably have a pretty spooky day. Homespun Haints is hosted by Becky Kielimnik and Diana Doty, and produced by Homespun Haints Media, LLC. Editing and music by Becky Kielimnik. Show notes by Diana Doty. If you have a ghost story and you'd like to be considered as a guest for this podcast, please visit our website at homespunhaints.com slash submit.